And with that being said, uh, let me introduce um, our first speaker of tonight or morning or day, depending on what it is in your time zone, um, who is, um, we have with us um, Chris Mohn. Um, hello, Chris. Hello. Um, so Chris uh, works at NVIDIA as a programmer uh, from NVIDIA, but actually uh, tonight is not representing NVIDIA, but as instead is here to talk about a personal project that he's been working on uh, for a while. And so I'm really excited to hear more about that. Um, Chris, over to you. Oh, and sorry, one more thing. If you have questions for Chris or any other speaker here, actually, please feel free to ask your questions on the uh, YouTube uh, like chat thingy. Um, and please do us a favor. And if you ask a question, please prefix it with question in capitals. So it's easier for us to spot that in the stream of comments. And so that we can pick out your question and ask it um, at the end of the talk. All right, with that, thanks. And over to Chris. Good evening, let me share my screen. Hi, my name's Chris Morn. Um, I work at NVIDIA doing graphics, uh, but today I'm here to talk about a personal project that I've been working on for a few years now. Uh, it's a live coding IDE. So who am I? I started my career at 3D Labs. Um, I read the OpenGL manual on the train on the way to the interview uh, and luckily got the job um, and ended up spending five years writing DirectX device drivers uh, and working on GPU architecture. After that, I uh, ended up at NVIDIA for about 23 years now and counting. Uh, I do tools for developers, all sorts of things, plugins, uh, particularly over the last few years, I've worked on the Insight tools, GPU Trace. I think I've got a, a screenshot of that here. You can see uh, this is GPU Trace on the top left, which is a tool that's looking at the uh, GPU and figuring out what's going on inside a frame. There's also, um, uh, a screenshot of Insight here, which is uh, showing, I think, some of the ray tracing stuff that's gone in recently, which I didn't work on. But um, the, uh, the the trace tool at the top here, the scrubber here, and the um, and the traces of the uh, graphics chip in the GPU trace application are things that I've tended to specialize in at uh, NVIDIA. Uh, the tools at the bottom, FX Composer, is a shader editing tool, which I worked on for a few years uh, early on, and then an even earlier example there of uh, shading. I do like to do other things. Over the last few years, I've done many experiments. I've done a couple of simple games, uh, played around with various visual things. I like to do visual programming. I like things that draw pretty pictures on the screen. My website there, if you want to look, these are just uh, images from Matt. So what is live coding? Um, it has very many definitions. Uh, one of the examples here is a, a, an algo rave where you've got people sat in front of laptops composing music and graphics. Uh, presumably there's an audience there as well uh, dancing to the music. Uh, it's, uh, it can be done in many different ways. It's quite typical, as you can see here, to have one programmer doing the graphics and one programmer doing the sound. Um, I've put a couple of links there. There's a really nice article in the FT about what Algorave is um, and the awesome creative coding website has hundreds of links for all sorts of interesting tools. So uh, I'm just going to highlight a few that are kind of important to me that have influenced me. Um, I'm going to talk about Sonic Pi which is a, a music uh, composition tool uh, written with a Ruby DSL uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about Tidal Cycles which is based on Haskell. I'm not going to show Tidal Cycles actually because uh, I'm having trouble running it on my machine which isn't uncommon. Uh, it's it's quite picky to install sometimes. Uh, I do have it running on my MacBook but not on this machine. Uh, I'm going to show Shader Toy, I'm going to show Super Collider which is often the foundation of some of these tools because it's the back-end synth that is generating the sound and I'm going to show Jibbo which is a JavaScript uh, audiovisual web application. So I'll just show you a, a little bit of each of these. So this tool is Super Collider, uh, probably familiar to many. Uh, it uses a built-in language called SCLang, uh, which you can use to generate quite complicated uh, synthesizers. I've got a simple example here. I can uh, hit Control Enter and we'll hear that there's two sine waves being played at 
different frequencies, 456 and 442. Uh, I've got a more interesting example here off the SDK. I'll try this one. You can see that that's, uh, well, you can hear that that one's a much more interesting sound. Um, and you can look at the code and it's quite obvious what it's doing. Uh, it's generating some envelopes. Um, it's doing some low pass filtering, white noise here to generate this snare drum. So uh, a powerful system. Uh, this is the Windows build. It's it's a little bit um, uh, difficult to use. The windows are very tiny on my display. Um, it didn't work for about a year on Windows. It, it seems to be quite Linux centric, uh, at least from the UI's point of view. Um, but it works, the, the editor is, is is sufficient. It has uh, pop-up tooltips and things like that, so it, it does help you write the code. Uh, but it's a very, as you can see, very minimal user interface. This application is Sonic Pi, a very popular live coding tool for music. It was created by a guy called Sam Aaron, and I really recommend you go over to his channel and listen to some of his music created with it. He has a very professional setup, which enables him to do this great AV performance that he does all over the world. Uh, there's an example here, a simple, uh, a, a more simple piece of code. If I run it, you can see it's uh, it plays the music and it's it's generating the the music at the back end using Super Collider actually, which uh, is being used as a server to to supply the synthesizer facilities. So that's Sonic Pi. This is a live coding environment for pixel shaders for graphics. Let's have a look at this one here. You get the shader code here and the visual effect there. I can actually spin it with a mouse. Very pretty. Let's have a look at it full screen. So this shader works by generating rays which are fired into the scene and stepping along the rays to try and figure out what the rays hit and what the colour of each pixel should be. The shader's here, so you can read through it and, and tweak the visual effect, see what happens by changing things. Let's make that a 9, see what that does. It moves the sphere further away because we changed the camera. The last one I want to show is Jibber. This one is a JavaScript live coding environment that runs inside a web browser. As you can see, uh, this program is generating some music. Uh, there's a drum pattern here, a synthesizer, and then it's doing an FFT of the audio in order to convert it into frequency bins, and then drawing the color bars. So it's a tool that you can use to make music and visuals. Uh, it's very nicely done, very easy to use, and very accessible because it's just right inside the browser. It's a nice tool. So if you look at all those tools, what's interesting about them, uh, they often have very basic editing. They're not built as powerful IDEs usually. Uh, they're, usually the editor is just the thing that they need to get to the next thing, and it's not something that's been not all the time been really thought about. Uh, so there are some exceptions. The Sonic Pi editor is pretty good. Um, pops up tooltips helps you with the code as you write it. Um, but but in general, a lot of these tools you see have very basic editing facilities. Um, there isn't usually any connection at all between the code you write and the music you hear. And what I mean by that is it's really difficult to see. You know why is that? Why is that? visual happening now and how does it relate to the sound I'm hearing and how does the sound I'm hearing relate to the code I wrote? Which note is being played from the code where I declared it, if you if you see what I mean. So that's an, an interesting uh, aspect of live coding and something that I want to do more research into. If you go to one of these algo riffs, there's these what I've called here transient moments of greatness where you might hear 10 minutes of confusion while the program is trying to figure out why they're program isn't sounding nice or they're experimenting with various um, pieces and, and they, they kind of haven't quite hit the groove yet there's not the music isn't there um, that doesn't always happen but it, it, it can happen um, but there are often these moments of greatness where everything comes together and there'll be a minute or two of great music and great visuals and, and I always think it's a shame that that goes away because the next stroke of the keyboard the shader has changed the music has changed and you've lost that 
you know, that serendipity of discovery that often occurs. So I've been thinking a lot about that. I would love to make my tool uh, capture snapshots of where it's at and allow people to play back a performance. And I think that that's somewhere I really want to get to eventually. As I said, some of the tools are complex to install. I couldn't get Super Collider to run on this machine for about a year. I couldn't, I can't get Tidal Cycles to run at all. Sonic Pi did install, although I had to remove a virtual drive, which took me an hour or two to figure out. Um, and I actually helped them improve that software at some point in the last year or two uh, to, to make it easier to install. Um, and they don't usually have error reporting debugging. Uh, there isn't really a, an easy way to see, you know, why is why is the machine suddenly dying? What's wrong? Where is the, you know, is the mach have I created too much music? Have I created too much? The, is the visual too expensive? Um, what's wrong with my shader? Is it really reporting the right line in the shader where I wrote the wrote the code incorrectly? That's something that happens quite a lot, um, and it can be very frustrating. And you know, as I said. What's my performance? I might want to be sure that when I give this performance on my laptop in a club, it's going to run, it's going to be fine, and it's not going to glitch. So this is the tool I've come up with. This is where I'm at so far. Uh, it's called Resonality. Um, it's an IDE for, for audio and visual. Um, it's kind of a toolbox, really. Uh, there is a, a layout mechanism, so you can be in this mode, you could be using it just to research shader development, but there's also a mode where you can swap the layout and it becomes more like a live coding environment where all the UI gets out of the way and you just see the shader code overlaid over the visuals. Uh, that's not something I'm going to demo today because it's currently a little broken, but uh, I'll get that fixed eventually. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's, it's what you make it, you can configure it for how you, how you want to use it. So I'm going to give a brief demo of where Resonality is at at the moment. Obviously, I'll show more specific parts of it later, but just to give you a general feel for how the tool fits together. Let's start in the editor here. We'll make uh, a synthesizer. This is the output graph, which is the synthesizer that sits at the back end and does the mastering and, and a bit of audio analysis. Um, it's needed in all graphs. Let's create something really simple. This is an oscillator. You see, it was created here. I can play with the UI. Let's go and make something more interesting down here. I've got an analog synth set, set up. Uh, Synthesizer down here. Let's try that one. You see, they're all playing nicely. The 3D renderer here is uh, sampling the audio information. We haven't got anything on the time yet line yet, but we haven't scheduled any notes. We'll do that in a minute. Uh, okay, so let's make some music using the ICSI language, just something simple. Um, we can make a drum paddle pattern here. Let's just stick with that. We can fire that off. Oh, uh, I need to initialize all the synthesizers. Let's do that. Uh, okay, so we've got that. Um, let's go back into the music and try again. We'll make the drum sound. You can see in the timeline now, we've got some patterns appearing and you can see the visuals reacting to the music, the pixel shader and the background. Let's uh, try some claps. And we can go in here and start playing, adding more synthesizer sounds. Let's just make a simple uh, pattern there. And let's make something more interesting with the mandolin. Let's say we do
just briefly turn off the music so you can hear me speak. Um, so as you can see, the timeline here, the, those patterns are being generated and, and, and scheduled. Uh, we had the visuals jumping around to the music. Um, the uh, synthesizers, uh, the orange lights here indicate which synthesizers are active and running at the, at the current time. There's a debug here, which is also telling me kind of how many notes are in each synth. Um, I'm going to show you next how to change the output of the visuals. So there I went in and changed the vertex shader, which is describing the shape there. And I've changed the background to a different shader. Uh, and the final thing I just wanted to show briefly uh, is the profiler, which has been running away in the background here. Uh, this thing can, uh, let, let's actually run it again with some audio so you get a more interesting pattern. We'll start it again. And you can see here, um, these are, I actually have a profiler that can look at the audio thread or the graphics thread. So the line along the top is what's going on in the graphics. The line along the bottom is what's going on in the uh, audio. And then I can analyze what's happening in the threads in the engine, what's happening in the UI and the graphics here. Uh, and that's it for an introductory demo. I'll, I'll cover some more parts of it later on. Uh, yeah, so the basic technology in the tool, uh, it's C++17, it would be 20 if I could get away with it. Um, I like to use the latest tools, why shouldn't I? On a project that's a, a pet project of mine, it means I can learn new things. I'm using the Janet scripting language, which looks a little bit like Lisp, but has some mutable pieces to it, I think. Um, it's a very nice language to embed, very easy to use. Uh, I've been really pleasantly surprised by it. I used to use a, a built-in scheme, a chippy scheme, I think it was but I've found Janet much more user-friendly in many different ways. Uh, it uses IAM GUI, and most game developers use IAM GUI for their um, overlays, for their toolkits when they're building games. It's a hugely popular uh, toolkit. I've only just noticed that that appears to be uh, mirrored on uh, on the slides, which is interesting. Um, and yeah, the graphics uh, library at the moment, I'm using OpenGL, just because OpenGL runs everywhere. It's uh, not really recommended on Mac anymore, but it does just run. Um, I also have built a DirectX 12 version of it that kind of works, but needs some uh, TLC. And I even started a Vulkan uh, version because I am interested in the graphics aspect as well as the sound. And I'm really looking forward to, to building those out. So um, the C++ bits, uh, because of um, the threading, I thought I'd just mention how I built these things. Uh, I'm just using stud thread, no libraries, no uh, big layers of anything. I, I Most of it is stud threads, atomics, condition variables. There's a single header thread pool class that I've put a link to there, which is fantastic. You just drop it in and you can schedule work uh, by passing in um, a, a lambda. It just does the job. Uh, and one of the foundations of my tool is this uh, Moody Camel Concurrent Queue, which allows you to uh, stick things into a queue and then pull them out at the other end without having to do any locking on mutexes. And it's incredibly useful uh, and incredibly easy to use. Uh, and no project like this gets built without a lot of help. Uh, so this is my package list from VC Package, uh, which I've said here is the package manager of champions. I was using various other approaches, but when I discovered VC Package, I didn't look back. It's unfortunately named. It isn't really Visual C only. It's a cross-platform package manager, which you kind of build yourself and, and just has so many libraries that just automatically install and work first time. And that's the full list, I think, of the ones that I'm currently using. Uh, the text editor. So uh, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, I wanted something a bit out of the ordinary. I wanted something where I could really go in and change how the text is displayed depending on what's going on. It also had to run in an OpenGL Vulkan ODX window, so it had to be able to draw itself. 
in a graphics window, which is not as easy as you might think. Uh, there are open source versions of basic editors that do that, but typically you're looking at the client server architecture if you wanted to use something like NeoVim, uh, which is complicated. Um, also, I wanted Vim support. Uh, if it's a tool that I'm using to do a live code performance, I don't want to be stuck using like notepad style editing. I just find that very frustrating. So that was something that I definitely needed. But of course, with that comes the problem that I want people to be able to use it too. So I can't force them to use Vim. So the editor had to be able to switch between a notepad mode and a Vim mode. Uh, as I said, I wanted it to have text adornments, uh, places over the text where it could show interesting things. Again, to show this link between what you've coded and what you're hearing. And uh, I wanted it to be able to show great error reports and warnings. So a couple of screenshots of it here. I'm going to demo it in a moment. Uh, you can see the screenshot on the left is the minimal mode that I mentioned earlier. Actually, the, uh, it's drawing uh, the visuals in the background and the live coder is just typing code. And notice that he's misspelled uniform there at the top and uh, the editor has highlighted the line, popped up a tooltip and told him exactly what's wrong. Um, and that's something that I'm really picky about. I want to make sure that it works well and it's easy to use. Screenshot on the left uh, is showing some Ixie Lang music and the orange highlights are showing which notes are currently being played. Uh, and it's uh, showing a split window and some syntax highlighting. So I'm gonna go ahead and give a little demo of Zep now. So here is Zep, the integral editor. You can see it looks very much like a Vim tool. You've got the status information at the bottom here. It adds syntax highlighting. You can see one of the interesting features here, it can highlight the text based on what's playing. So this is actually feeding back from what the music is generating and telling me which notes are actively being playing. And I'll, I'll demo that later on. I can search for things. I can search for mandolin, for example, hop between buffers, search for connect. I can do all the usual Vim stuff. Um, let's delete three words. I can also switch to notepad mode and then it just behaves like notepad. And it's not modal anymore, which is obviously required for users who don't like Vim or don't use it. And there are adornments built in all sorts of different ways to mark text. For example, add an underline here. Let's put another one in. And the tooltip here, of course, also a demo in this case, but enabling me to underline and highlight parts of the shader that are wrong so that the end user knows what's going on. And that's Zep, the uh, integrated editor. So let's talk a little bit about audio, which is why we're here. Um, most of you will know that uh, the typical starting point is this callback function that you get from your sound card driver or API. You're asked to fill in a buffer and uh, given a number of frames and you return that to the sound card driver and it sends it to the hardware and so hopefully you hear something at some point in the near future. Um, and it, on the face of it, it looks pretty simple, right? You can uh, start making sine, sine waves and hear nice, nice tones coming out of uh, the speaker. The first thing I found, which was interesting, was I was making, combining a few sine waves and suddenly there was too much latency and the sound was broken. And I was like, well, this isn't, I'm not gonna get very far here. Um, it turned out, of course, that calling sign on, at least on Windows in debug, is really quite expensive. Uh, and by the time you've called that a few thousand times, you're starting to use up uh, your CPU. So, uh, yeah, that was an interesting revelation early on. Uh, you can't use Mutex uh, in, a, in the sound thread. This is something I learned recently from Tima's talk last, uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, I was using Mutex, I was kind of getting away with it, but it certainly helped when I removed all of my locks and put in a spin lock for the very the small case where I needed it. You can't dynamically allocate memory. I am doing a little bit of that at the moment, but not intentionally. I need to uh, finish sorting that out. Um, and you, can, uh, you have the problem of synchronizing what you're doing on the audio thread with what you're doing in the rest of the system. If you want to show the notes that are being played, um, or, or anything else that uh, that you figure out on the audio thread, it, you've got that synchronization problem where you can't use locking. So that, that's a hard problem too. Uh, the other interesting thing I immediately found was that using a stud vector was very slow. Um, and that's because there's a lot of debug uh, wrappers around that in Visual Studio on, on Windows. 
Um, the easy workaround is to sacrifice the range checking and just make a pointer from the beginning of the container and then you can walk around in memory regardless and it won't uh, do all the checks that it normally does. So just to think about this a little bit more, uh, you have the uh, along the top here, this is typically what's going on. The sound card is reading the previous frame you sent and playing the music while you're filling up the next frame. There might be multiple of these, there's probably more than one deep stack of frames, but uh, that's essentially what's happening. You don't really have much control over it. Uh, last month's audio programmer's talk did uh, cover the new Linux audio API, which has some interesting features, but generally you've got a buffer, you have to fill it in reasonable time, uh, and that's more or less it. Because it's sound, there's not, you know, you're making a, bo a bunch of sound samples to be played, that's all you're doing. Um, but if we look at the bottom here, the interesting thing about this is that on a graphics chip, this problem is massively multiplied. You can have multiple buffers, they can contain different things, you can have multiple queues, you can assemble them on different threads. Um, the GPU, you can pass the GPU barriers and semaphores to tell it when things can be accessed and when they can't and to schedule things. Um, and there are multiple hardware queues as well. The GPU can be uh, copying memory from one part of its uh, one region to another while receiving geometry data. So on the one hand, graphics is much more complicated. On the other hand, there are more options, more, more solutions to problems. Um, and, and graphics chips are, you know, obviously much more complicated than, than sound chips. That's obvious. That's why, for example, when a new uh, game console comes out, it usually takes a few years before uh, the game developers really start to push it to the extreme and get the best out of it. Um, but yeah, I thought that was interesting that, um, that there's a bit of a parallel there. Obviously, I'm used to this problem of feeding GPUs, so when I started looking at the audio side, I kind of had a feel for what I needed to do and uh, how to make it work. I've put a little link there for uh, NVIDIA's Insight uh, talk on GPU Trace, which uh, covers all sorts of things about how to optimize using the GPU if you're interested in have, looking that up. So this is uh, the next problem that I came to, which was uh, generating just simple sine waves. As I said, I couldn't just call sine. You, you just don't do that because it's too slow. Uh, so then I came across this thing called uh, wavetables. Uh, this is in, from the ear level website, which is a fantastic resource for this thing. Uh, and you can see he's got a, a little image there of um, all the wavetables he's generated and when they are switched between. But essentially the problem is uh, that you can't just sample one lookup table for your sine waves because then if you are sampling it um, at different rates, you will get aliasing. The solution is to make multiple wavetables and pick the parts of the tables depending on how on the frequency that you want to generate. Now in graphics, this is very similar to something called mipmaps. Um, we generate multiple resolution versions of the image uh, and then in, at runtime the graphics chip is sampling them depending on the coverage on the screen of the texture map to pixel ratio. So if, if, you're, if the texture is a tiny little, is on a rock at the back of the scene and it only occupies three pixels on the screen, then you're going to pick one of those tiny little images. But if the if the rock's right in front of the player, you're probably going to use the high resolution image and, and they are filtered and switched between using mipmaps in, on the graphics hardware. And the reason for that is to stop aliasing. It's the same problem essentially, except it's visual aliasing versus audio aliasing. So that was uh, an interesting comparison I came across. And there are some links there if you're interested in following up on that. So once you've generated sine waves and you've got that running nice and fast, uh, it gets a bit boring. They're not very interesting to listen to. Um, and so the next thing was, where do I go next? How do I learn something uh, new about audio to make some more, the kind of sounds that I wanted to make? And I discovered after a lot of searching these great resources, uh, there was somebody from on the last meeting talked about uh, audio kit and um, that uses internally uh, a DSP library in C called Soundpipe. And these two things combined really gave me all the knowledge I needed in order to generate pretty sounds. Audio Kit has this great sample code where it calls Soundpipe and it builds a pipeline. Um, the Audio Kit Synth 1 application is you can get all the source, you can just read through it and you can see uh, the example I've posted here. 
Um, they're doing some oscillation, some panning, some phaser and crossfade, and it just shows you, you know, what parameters to use, how how these things work. And there's all sorts of little tricks and tips in there that uh, I would never have known without a reference. Um, just different and interesting ways to do things. So yes, once you've got to that point, um, well at least once I got to that point and I was generating nice sounds, I wanted something that was configurable. I want the live coder to be able to say, today I'm going to have this you know, weird and wonderful synthesizer with uh, four oscillators feeding into this low pass filter and doing this and that and the other. Um, and I wanted them to be able to configure that perhaps before the performance or maybe even during if they're brave. Um, so I wanted to build a graph, essentially. Um, uh, um, if you're familiar with this kind of, um, of approach, this is a Bitwig, for example, um, where they have uh, a tool inside of Bitwig. I'm not sure I can remember the name of it, but it's, uh, it allows you to drop these blocks in and connect things together. So this is a triangle wave and it's fed into a, some kind of envelope and then fed to the output. And you can have a lot of fun playing with this. I actually love Bitwig. I think it's such a beautifully designed app and the UI aesthetic pleases me greatly. Um, and I actually copied the way the buttons, my, my control knobs work from Bitwig. Um, and mine are similar enough that I'm almost convinced that they're using the same graphics library as me. Um, but anyway, so that's, uh, that's one use of uh, graphs in the audio industry. This image on the right is actually an output from my graph. I have a script command which can just drop a created graph onto a website and display um, the connection information of how the graph is built, which is great for debugging. So how does a DAG typically work? This uh, directed acyclic graph, um, at least in my system, the way this works is I start at the output and I walk back into the graph evaluating all the inputs. So if I'm at the mixer here, I might think, okay, can I run the computation of this mixer? And then I look at my inputs and realize, hang on, they're not updated yet. They haven't been updated for the current frame. So then I walk back into the parent node, the oscillator, and I have the oscillator doesn't have any inputs, so it generates its data and validates this blue arrow worth of data. The ADSR does the same thing, and then eventually the mixer can then run. So in a directed acyclic graph, you want to run every node once, um, and that's the basic approach to, to generating a graph. It's, it's powerful because you can the user can lay out a graph of nodes how they want, and you just figure out what the output node is and walk back into the graph. And as you evaluate it, once you've finished, you have your sound samples. That's the theory anyway. Graphs are interesting because they're used in graphics all the time. Um, this is quite an old image, I think, um, from a few years back. Um, so you can imagine where they're at today. But this is uh, a, uh, the rendering graph from the Battlefield 4 game. And you can see all of the, um, the nodes here that are building up this scene. And I don't know what they're doing. Perhaps they are generating lighting effects, working out depth information. They, they come together eventually to form the final frame of the game, which is probably this right hand node right at the far end. And they had built a debugger to, uh, there's a talk about this at GDC, I think it was, that you can go watch if you want, but it sure talks about the complexity of building this big complex game using a graph. Um, so yeah, graphs are something I've worked on before. I'm very familiar with how they work um, and surprisingly similar concepts. Another tool in uh, graphics is, a, is called Maya, which is a, a CAD application and internally that uses a scripted graph, which I have used a bit in the past to write plugins. So this is a, a bit of a closer look at my graph. You can see uh, here I'm showing the same thing, a, a slope and an oscillator being fed into a mixer. I have some mechanism to get the data into the graph uh, from the timeline or from a lock-free queue, and it sits in this pool of notes in the graph. And there's a, this is basically keeping track of what notes are currently active and playing. There are inputs to some of these units uh, using Portamento, so that if the user twiddles a knob, um, it doesn't immediately switch. It kind of it catches up slowly um, in order to make the user interface to the synthesizer clean and not sound jerky when you when you're adjusting things. Um, so yeah, I've, I've showed some inputs here, and then once the uh, once this bit of graph is evaluated, it can output two different types of information. The ADSR is outputting control information, which is uh, control slopes for um, for controlling the volume of the uh, the sound. That's what this one's doing, and I have flow information, which is actually a polyphonic bundle of audio. So what happens is at at each tick, the graph has to 
sample all the notes at once and make sure that it generates channels for every active playing note. So each compute step in each node in my graph um, has to do uh, all the work for all the notes at the same time. Uh, and essentially this mixer here is taking two types of input. It's got the control and the flow input and the control is going to um, use the slope to modify the audio channel and out, out of the mixer at the back end you'll still have those polyphonic channels but they'll all have been uh, mixed using the control slope. This is uh, an example of, uh, well, pseudocode of how it works inside uh, that oscillator. It looks at each note. Um, it creates a channel for each note, which is fast because it uses a memory pool uh, to, to cache channels inside the graph. And then it walks the frame count of the audio, samples the wavetable, for example, and stores the output data. And it's doing, as you can see, for each note, for each sample in the frame. So it's doing all of that work at once and outputting those channels. Sometimes the, there are two channels and they represent stereo, but often there might be many all bundled together. So how do I handle modifying the graph? This is a, a problem that I became aware was fundamental in audio is if you have your graph running, uh, how do you change it? I looked at SuperCollider. SuperCollider does it, I believe, by sending messages from the uh, UI thread into the audio thread, which are effectively instructions for how to modify the graph. Um, I didn't choose to do it that way. I modify the graph outside of the audio thread, essentially making it dormant for the time I need in order to edit it. Um, and I'll come up with quite a clean approach to this, I think. What happens is um, the graphs are all running in the audio thread here on the right. The first thing the audio do thread does is spin locks. It does a try lock, which doesn't actually take the lock. It just spins and waits. Um, it doesn't do a mutex lock, I should say, but it will spin until it can get a lock on this mutex here. And then it'll process all the active graphs and then it will remove, it'll free the lock. Um, but this is engineered so that this try lock is very minimal. It almost never happens, in fact. The reason it never happens is because on the UI thread, on the other thread, it's doing this thing where it does a lock marks a graph inactive and then frees the lock immediately. So what the threads outside of the audio thread are doing effectively are, are saying, okay, I need to change this graph. The users just rerun the script. What I'll do is quickly mark the graph as being inactive using this lock and I'll only take the lock for a moment. Um, and then once it's done that, the audio thread side will no longer play that graph if it comes in for another audio cycle. This means that really the uh, audio side is never waiting, uh, but there may be occasions where the audio side does not have a graph to play when asked for frames. Now that will only happen if the user is rebuilding the graph, essentially tearing apart and rebuilding the synthesizer. So that's not a not a problem. It just it, that's how it works. Uh, you could there might be interesting ways in which I could make this delay until the synthesizer is quiet and all that sort of thing, but I haven't thought about that too greatly. But this does the job really because. Typically, people are building synthesizers before they start playing the music. But yeah, this is a, an interesting way to, to ensure that the graph is never modified while it's running inside the audio thread, and the audio thread is never really waiting to be able to use the graphs. Yeah, so an active graph is on the audio thread. If it's inactive, it's on other threads being manipulated. Um, if a graph is awake, it requires compute. Uh, but if it's asleep, it can save all of that work. There's no point running a graph just to get a bunch of zeros out of the, on the audio channel. So when is a graph asleep? This is something that I've wrestled with a bit. Um, I think I've got a reasonably good solution now. Um, you could say that the graph is complete when the slope, the ADSR slope is finished. That would be one approach. Uh, you could say that it's finished when there's no more sound coming out of it. There's a danger there that some effect unit is about to cycle round and play something again though. Um, you could say when an effect is done, for example, if you've got reverb and you know the reverb is adding another half second or something, then you could say, okay, I just need to know, I need to finish in a half second because no more notes are coming in. Uh, or yeah, when the user says, there's no reason why script code couldn't tell these things to go on and off at some point. In practice, I use a kind of a combination of all four. Uh, effectively, all my notes in my graph are allowed to say, please keep this note active when they play. Um, and effects are also allowed to say, I want time to run for another three seconds after all notes are finished. 
uh, and there is also a back end check to make sure that that synthesizer isn't playing. There's a danger, of course, that with all of these mechanisms, you might find a graph that is continuing to play and consuming resources when it doesn't need to, but I consider that really a bug. There should be some reason why the music slows down or finishes, unless it's a graph that is designed to just keep playing continuously, something that has a delay. So yes, Janet scripting. Um, this is how I build the graph. Uh, as I said before, it's a Lisp-like scripting language, very simple and easy to use, very easy to embed. It has a great foreign function interface, if you know what one of those is. Uh, and it's easy, uh, it, it was an easy step along the way to building graphs. Eventually I want to get to the point where, like Bitwig, where I can drop nodes using the mouse and drag lines between them and build synthesizers that way. I think that's, that's always something I've wanted to do and never quite got there. Um, I have a lot, I've got a long way along that route now and I'm pretty close to being able to do that. But this was a very simple way to get the graph building without having to worry about building the visual tool first. Uh, so in this example, I'm creating a simple synth uh, and then I'm adding an, an oscillator. This FM op oscillator is basically two oscillators where the uh, frequency of one is being modulated by the other. And then at the bottom here, I define that synthesizer and I just play it. And I'm going to give you a demo of that. Let's go a little deeper here and just play a little with the Janet scripting language. You can see here, um, it's it's quite Lisp-like, but very easy to follow. This particular part of the code here is building an output graph. I have the concept of a graph which runs after all the other graphs, uh, and that's where I do the mastering and add the uh, audio analysis. The audio analysis can be put anywhere in any graph, but I always have one on the output so that I can see what's going on. So if I just evaluate this, there's our little output graph. We see the the mastering node and the audio analyzer, which isn't getting any audio. But let's go and make uh, another simple script. This is a very simple one here. Uh, this defines a simple synth, which is made up of uh, an FM oscillator, which has uh, one oscillator com controlling um, another. So let's define that and let's play it. I can also just hit keys on my keyboard here and yeah, so two oscillators. Um, I can play with the attack curve in the UI, of course, and I can also send commands from the script. Let's do something a bit more interesting. Um, there's a function here which adds a special effect path. So we'll define that first. And then here's an analog synth. And this is a specialization of that analog synth, which creates this, what I've called dark sci-fi uh, synthesizer. I can also hit keys on the keyboard as before. And of course, I can still tweak things. I can turn the sub oscillator up. And change things as I go. I've got the delay on there and the reverb you can hear. Turn that off here. Maybe add some FM, FM synthesis into that as well. So yeah, that's the Janet scripting. Um, there are lots of examples in here and I need to build more interesting things. Um, I have some things where I build a DX7 style of synthesis just because that growing up, that was something I knew. Um, here's a, a function that builds a three on three operators. Let's try that. These are various functions that set it up. Oh, here's a flute. Let's do uh, timpani drums. And there is the synthesizer that was built. You can see all these different oscillators feeding in in a different way. It's quite effective. You could probably also notice um, the notes flowing along the filters here being fed back. And it's, I can zoom in if I can just find my mouse wheel. 
eventually this will be a full graph editor where I can drag and drop things and connect things together but at the moment it's showing the control surface view which allows the artist to tweak the uh, synthesizer while it's playing but that's the, uh, the Janet language One of the challenges, of course, of UI is how do you communicate with the audio thread? Uh, this is one approach that I've took. I use, I called it lazy memory originally. I'm not sure if I'm still calling it that, but um, effectively, I on the audio thread when it wants. This is the this is the case for these little blue dots, which are representing the notes where they currently are on the ADSR slope. What happens is in the audio thread, it reads. Um, it has a buffer. A, a pair of buffers that it's working on. The audio thread has access to one of them at any one time. So it gets the right buffer, it writes to it without locking, it knows that it can always access it, and then it does a try lock. Um, if the try lock fails, it just throws it away and forgets about it. If the try lock succeeds, it swaps the pointers and now the write buffer becomes the, re uh, the read buffer. So what this is doing is essentially ensuring that the audio thread runs in constant time and never waits. The disadvantage, of course, is that it might throw away information about where those notes are, but that's okay. On the UI side, it's locking the read buffer, it, it does a proper lock, um, it uh, reads the notes and processes them. They may be old because the audio thread may not have swapped them, but that doesn't matter. Uh, it's just going to show the previous position. This is happening so fast that as long as those notes update you know, even 60 times a second or whatever, or less than, you're never going to see the difference. So this is a an approach I've used in order to make sure that the UI can always run and show something and the audio thread is never blocked because I don't care about perfect accuracy of showing this note information. I use the same approach for the FFT. Um, it's slightly modified in that the audio thread now puts the audio frames onto a lock-free queue. This queue um, is fed until it's full. It, if it's too full, it won't even bother doing that. Um, the FFT processing thread wakes up periodically, samples the, pulls things off the queue again because it's the lock-free queue, um, updates the audio processing, and then the same approach as on the previous slide happens where it tries to write memory, but it will discard it if it can't. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so on the UI thread, the same, uh, the same thing as before happens. It always locks and reads and processes. It might well be processing old audio data. In practice, it almost never is. It's very hard to see this ever happen on the profile. So there are just a couple of approaches I've taken to connecting the UI to the audio. Yeah. I have a regular tick in the system. This is how I manage patterns. Uh, obviously, um, the user might be creating musical scripts which contain lists of notes to be played in a pattern and, and I need to schedule these things so I need a, I need a reliable timer and this is the best one I've found so far um, essentially there's a thread running which sleeps for a given amount of time and then wakes up and then ticks all the consumers and then it sleeps until the calculated time for the next for where it should wake up it doesn't sleep um, it, it, it wants to wake up at a regular interval. It doesn't really care how long the, the middle part of this takes, but it should always wake up at the same time interval. And in my measurements, uh, I've had microsecond um, drift when doing this. Um, certainly no more than a millisecond. Uh, I think 700 microseconds rings a bell, but it, it doesn't drift very much and it's the best I've come up with so far. Uh, obviously, this is only scheduling information. It doesn't have to be perfectly in time because the notes can be uh, are also picked off at the right time in the audio thread when they're being played. This is an example of pattern scheduling. This is still somewhat a work in progress. It works. You'll see in the demos it works, but I still am not happy with the design. Um, but essentially what I have is external, maybe a MIDI keyboard. Uh, I might have Orca, which I'll mention briefly later. Um, I have Ixilang. They're all doing timeline updates. Uh, and what they're doing is they're, they're putting notes on the end of this uh, ring of data, which is uh, contains all of the notes that are scheduled to be played. You can see the blue line in the middle of the, the visualization here is, is time zero when they have to be played. So these are all in the past. These are the ones that are just about to be played. Uh, and what's happening is the UI thread is consuming the back while the other threads, the timer threads, are producing notes. 
and the audio thread is doing exactly the same thing. Now, interestingly, the they might end up not quite scheduled at the same time. Um, the UI thread might be behind for whatever reason, but that doesn't matter. They're, they're pretty much the same, uh, but there's no lock between them. There's no link between what the UI thread and the audio thread are doing. The audio thread is basically sampling the notes that are upcoming and figuring out when it needs to play them. And as long as these two, this consumer and producer in the ring buffer never collide, uh, we're all good. Uh, this is kind of the design I've gone for. It's not quite right yet. It does work, um, uh, which, you know, tends to make, I mean, I just leave it alone to, and work on the next complicated problem, but that's where I'm at with that. Yes, I mentioned Dixie Lang. It's a powerful music language. Uh, I've wrote my own parser for it because it's fairly trivial. Uh, it's great as a beginner synthesizer, a sequencer for the synth, uh, and, and Jibber actually used it as their inspiration for a music language. I think it's it's underused and um, it, it's definitely something worth looking into. So Janet isn't the only thing that um, I can uh, use to sequence music with. Uh, Orca is something else that I've been looking at. This is uh, um, an esoteric programming language. It allows you to build little these little cellular automata programs that can run and schedule notes and fire off uh, events to the sequencer. I haven't uh, got this running at the moment. I have had it running in the past. It's a lot of fun to play with and it's potentially going to be another way in which you can schedule notes. I just thought I'd show it because it sits inside the editor. It's already implemented in there. Uh, music and graphics. Yes. How do we connect the two together? Um, there are several ways, but essentially you need to get the information about what the music's doing to the GPU in some way. So the way that I approach this is uh, I convert the music to frequency bins using a fast Fourier transform. Uh, that happens on a thread, as I mentioned earlier on. Um, and those frequency bins are then converted into a four row texture, texture which you can see here expanded out. Uh, the top two rows are audio data, the bottom two rows are the frequency analysis data. And because they're in a texture, the graphics chip can sample those and use them in any way it sees fit, which is great at, at the pixel level per pixel on the screen. The image on the right is actually a pixel shader, which is sampling them and drawing a more traditional um, uh, equalizer, which is which obviously runs very fast in a single frame. It's just a single, uh, well, it's a pair of triangles drawn as a quad. Are uh, very very easy to um, very easy to accelerate for a, for a GPU. It also converts the um, the frequency bins into a four component vector, and that's used in the vertex shader in order to modify geometry. Uh, which is useful if you want to have things bouncing around on screen to the music, for example. There's a problem here, though, which is how about all about latency, really. How do you get that data in reasonable time? The, the issue is if the microphone hears a sound, but the visual only updates um, a fraction of a second later than that, then it's really easy from a user's point of view to see, to see that disconnect, to hear the audio and see something. It's like bad lip, lip syncing on a, on a TV movie. Um, and there are all sorts of reasons for that. There's whatever the audio hardware is doing, the size of the frame that's being captured, um, the size of the binning that you're doing on the Fourier analysis, how fast that is, how long it takes to upload the texture to the GPU, how long it takes the GPU to render the frame, and then the V blank sync, which is uh, if the screen is locked to a refresh, or whether, or if you've got a frame uh, lock, uh, a frame per second cap, because you don't want to run too fast and starve the system of resources. So there's a lot of things going on that can mean that the distance between the microphone and the and what you see um, aren't always the same. And this, the worst case for this is a microphone, which is sitting in a room listening to music, and then which some live coders have. Uh, and then you see, uh, you can see that the visuals aren't quite synced to the audio. That's why often when you go to these things, people will do visual demos that are more ambient, uh, which pick up the general feel of the music, but don't tend to bounce along to the beat. Not often anyway, um, because it's a harder problem to solve. It's not unsolvable, but the nice thing about this system that I've built is it's an integrated system where I have first class knowledge of all the pieces, uh, which makes this a little bit easier to solve. One thing you can do as well, which I intend to do but haven't done yet, is you can insert a delay between generating the sound and sending it to the driver to give the graphics chance to catch up. And it sounds funny to say that the graphics needs to catch up, but typically that might be the case. If you have a really slow shader running, you know, at only 10 frames a second, your actual limit on those visuals is 
is what's causing the the visible delay that tends to be the critical path in my experience if i whack up the frame rate of the graphics to a few hundred frames per second i can pretty much get the audio and the visuals to sync up exactly and look just um look as if they're happening at the same time so that's an interesting problem one way in which i can look at problems like that is with the built-in profiler um, graphics tools often have a scrubber like this as I showed right at the beginning in tools that I've written uh, in my day job um, and so it's something that I've written actually many times before so this wasn't very difficult for me to do because I knew all the ins and outs of it um, this is an example just shown here of what might happen if the audio uh, takes too long so for some reason there's a blockage here the audio has taken too long this this the, this frame of the UI is 35 milliseconds, so the audio is probably uh, just over half that. And you can see what's happened. The the um, hardware, the audio hardware has gone, oh, oh, I need more data. So it's started to ask for more and more frames, and it keeps asking until it catches up, and then you get a gap. And so this is the, um, the sound card driver doing the right thing and making sure that it's going to have enough buffer so that it's not starved. And the vertical um, distance here it represents what I think should be the longest the audio should take in order not to um, starve, starve the hardware. This is uh, all the audio catch-up I just showed. Um, this is a closer look at a graph. You can see um, all the sub-nodes inside the graph being evaluated in parallel on different threads. Uh, this is an example of something that I found when I first built the uh, profiler that was incorrect. The, the spectrum graph was waiting uh, and the UI was blocked and that shouldn't have happened and it wasn't how I designed the system as I showed earlier on with the, um, the lazy memory approach but there was a bug, there was something that wasn't doing the right thing and it only became apparent on one particular frame, this is actually a zoom in but it, it only showed up by grabbing a few thousand frames and looking and seeing, ah, why is that one taking longer? So uh, that's more or less it. Um, I just wanted to cover what I'm thinking about for the future. The first priority is obviously to get this into people's hands so they can play with it. Um, I love building tools. I love to see what people do with them. I think I will consider it a success when I see somebody live code using it. Um, I'd like to implement the session recording that I mentioned. I, I, I think that's really nice. I, I would love to be able, people to be able to say, hey, look, check out this live coding performance and just send you a project that you can load and watch on your local machine um, or record something that they did the night before and figure out why it sounded so good at that point. Uh, visual graph editing, as I said, I'd, I'd like to be able to drag and drop nodes and hook them together. I think that's a fun thing to do anyway, both for graphics and for um, audio actually. Uh, geometry generation, yeah, the, at the moment I'm just drawing spheres and toruses and things. Uh, I can use a geometry shader. Uh, I haven't tried that for a while, but I'm sure it still works. Uh, but I would like some way to script the graphics more so that I can control, generate all sorts of interesting primitives. I'm interested in music languages. I think there's a lot uh, of interesting things that can be done there, especially once you've got to the point where you've built an IDE that has a pattern runtime, can can efficiently schedule things. I, I hope that people might take the tool and just say, hey, I'm going to go use it to experiment making a new language. I think that would be awesome. Um, I'd like to get DX12 and Vulkan. That's kind of more in my wheelhouse and I'm really interested in shader editing and shader authoring. Uh, and ray tracing and VR, I've thought, wouldn't it be cool if you could have, you know, a, a VR environment where you were live coding and that's that's pretty cool and, and because of the way that I've built all these pieces it it would lend itself to that it could be dropped in the editor obviously can sit inside a 3d world and all the pieces I, I suspect I could get there with that if I had the energy we'll see and that's the end of my talk thank you um, thank you Chris wow this was really really impressive stuff thank you um, yeah I mean Obviously, you've done this is a huge project, but thank you so much for like giving us a glimpse um, under the hood, like how all of this works. And I think it's like a mixture of like you know, I guess anyone who's built like an audio engine before has bumped into some of those problems before. But like seeing like your solutions to it and like just like the whole like the whole picture and also like your particular solutions, that's that's super interesting. And just like it's a massive project. It's like so impressive, you know, how you just. Uh, put this together so um yeah 
definitely very impressed. Thank you for sharing all that. Oh, thanks for saying that. It, it, it's a fun. I could have talked all night about it, I think, I suspect. <laughs> and I had about twice as many slides, I think. Um, but uh, yeah. I, I do have a question. How long did it take you to put all of this together? It's many years, actually. It's not um, a, a short project because I only do it part time. So um, as I was saying to Josh before we started, I, you know, I get up in the morning, I go out early for breakfast. I take my laptop and I, and most of it's written in a coffee shop um, before I start work in the mornings. Um, and I usually get uh, the day on Saturday or, or some big part of the day on Saturday while my children are at school. Um, poor them. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's taken a few years. Um, the, the editor was a sideline that a tangent that I went off on, which took a full year of part time work just to build that piece. Um, the graphics stuff is some of it is all ancient, you know, little experiments and old things I did. Some of it needs reworking by now. Um, and yeah, the audio probably took it's probably a year of part time work to get the audio stuff done. The, the UI looks complicated, but I've done that kind of thing throughout my career. So for me, that isn't the hard part. The hard part is the generating the audio and figuring out how to play the audio graph. And that's why I concentrated on that. But, but yeah, it's multi year project, several years, in fact. And there's no clear defined end, right? It might be finished next year or the year after. Um, and it, you know, it depends on the energy I have and, and how well things go. Um, yeah, that would have been my next question. Like, when is this actually going to be, you know, out and like when can you get <laughs> hands on it? But I guess, yeah, you just answered it. Like, you yeah, yeah, I mean, my, my, my preliminary, my, well, my work in progress is that I, I want to have something shipped by early next year. Um, there's a different, difficult problem here, right? Because it's all going to be open source. It's all free. Parts of it already are sh shipped. The editor is already out there and people have dropped it into their own engines and done things with it. Um, but yeah, it's it, the, the, uh, the idea is to get it in people's hands because once it's open sourced, I might get some help, <laughs> which would also be great. I, but I don't want to open source it and then have it not be finished well enough that people can't get something out of it. The worst thing to do would be to ship it and then have the bugs get in the way of everybody and everybody kind of walk away from it and say, oh, you know, I'm, I can't use this because it's not right yet. Um, but it is modular. So the audio project is an entirely separate application that I can just run without the graphics. So I'm thinking that I'm going to just ship the audio first and you'll be able to play with the synthesizer stuff and the note sequencing without generating visuals. If I do that, it'll give me, you know, another few months to, to make the graphics really great. Um, so, yeah. That's that's what I'm thinking, but I, I just there will be some of it shipped next year for sure, especially the audio part. Yeah. But I'm not putting that pressure on myself because obviously I have a day job, I have a lot of work that, that I have to do in that, um, and so I can't, uh, you know, that has to come first, obviously. Well, yeah, thanks. I'm really looking forward to this coming out at some point. I definitely learned a lot from uh, you know just you talking through these problems that you solved. It's it's really really so interesting. Um, we do have uh, quite a few questions from the YouTube uh, chat. Sure. Um, so Igor Abdul Angela asks, what are your thoughts about pure data, uh, vanilla, for live coding? It's really cool. Um, I'm on a, a, a Slack uh, group called The Future of Code, where they talk about all of these kinds of tools, building software using dragging and dropping blocks and all that sort of stuff. And I think pure data is great. And um, I did kind of allude earlier on to the fact that a lot of these tools are, are sometimes not easy because they're all uh, open source and they're not finished. And pure data is one of those that won't really wouldn't run very well on my machine. It, it isn't high density aware. So I've got a 4K monitor. I run pure data, I can't see anything. <laughs> and I'm forever tweaking fonts and stuff. So I, I'd love to play more with pure data, but uh, until they you know, sort it out and make it work well on my machine, then I, then I, I won't. Um, I've got a MacBook, so I, 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 occasionally, I have dabbled with it, um, and I think it's a fascinating way to do it. And I've seen live coders use that and tools like it. So uh, there's a one, there's a paid version as well called Max MSP, which I've never seen, but I hear is very good. Um, obviously, because they have to pay for it, I haven't, I haven't purchased it. Right. Uh, so Joe Black is asking, have you considered doing audio and DSP on the GPU? Yeah, that's a fun thing to do, right? I haven't done any research in that area. Um, it might need bigger brains than mine, I don't know. Um, I mean, I've done graphics programming and I'm, I'm capable of looking into that, but if I went down that rat hole, I would never come back, I suspect. <laughs> and I'd never get the thing finished, so. Right, thank you. So, um, George Conturas is asking, how does one get into a complicated API like Vulkan if you only have some G OpenGL experience? 
I would start on the tutorials. There's a fantastic tutorial. I think it's called Vulcan Tutorial. If you Google it, it'll be the first hit you get. Um, they've got a really great one. Um, uh, Vulcan's hard, right? DirectX 12 is hard. It's not for the faint-hearted, even if you've done OpenGL. It, it takes like a thousand lines of code to draw a triangle on the screen to get your first thing on the screen. You actually have to type a thousand lines of very complicated code, and you really have to understand what they're doing and what the hardware is doing in order to set it up. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not to discourage anyone. I think it's graphics programming is fascinating. I hope I conveyed that in the talk. Um, but yeah, I would start with the Vulkan tutorial. That's that's definitely the place I would go first, and just you know, just do it, just get on with it. All right. Um... Okay, we have a couple more questions. So John Rupsch is asking, it seems like your understanding of audio coding really benefited from truly understanding graphics first. So would you say that understanding audio is beneficial for graphics, like the other way around? Um, are you, you're asking if audio has learned, learned, taught me anything about graphics? I think, I, I'm not sure I understand the question 100% right. I think, I think yeah. they're, they're saying that obviously like your understanding of audio has benefited from doing graphics first. And I guess they're asking whether that's the case and whether you think that's also the case the other way around. Yeah, I, I, I did actually see that question as it went past on the chat. Um, and I think that was probably before I had demoed some of the, some more of the parallel cases between graphics and sound. So on, in that direction, certainly, you know, when I encountered wavetables, I was like, well, this is just mip mapping. It's just, you know, audio mip mapping and not visual mip mapping. Uh, and, and also my knowledge of program, because I used to write um, drivers for GPUs. So I've got quite intimate knowledge of what the hardware is doing. So when I see an audio API that says tick, give me some frames, I know in my head that what's happening here is that this buffer is some kind of shared device memory or something that's going to get DMA'd to the hardware and how it's going to consume it and how it's going to manage the timing of that. I've got the knowledge of, of those things. So that, that helps with my understanding for sure. Um, did I learn anything in the other direction? Um, probably, yes. Uh, one of the main things I learned is, is how to do better threading code. I'm still learning that. I mean, I've talked with you, Tima, on um, Discord about problems I've had in the past, and but I've, I've become a much better C++ um, multi-threaded programmer now. I, I, I think that I can write stable threading code now that I couldn't do before, because although we do a little bit of that in my day job, not, nowhere near what I had to do to make this work. So, so yeah, there was a bit of... In terms of a learning experience, I would say it's been great. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Actually, I think that's something interesting maybe about the human brain. I don't know. I find that often when you like read a book about audio, or I do that sometimes in my own talks when I just explain like basic audio concepts that you kind of um, use like an analogy and like this is the analogous thing in the graphics world. And that tends to like help a lot of people understand it. And you actually had quite a few of those in your talk, uh, which were completely new to me, like the whole mid-maps thing. It's like, wow, I've never heard about this, but this is really, this is a really cool yeah. way to explain what's going on, you know? You had quite a few moments in your talk like that, so. Yeah, and mid-maps have been really around since, uh, you know, texturing was invented. Yeah. Mid-maps have been around forever. And these days we do all sorts of even more complicated and interesting things along those lines. But yeah, yeah, it's, it's good stuff. Um, so finally, we have one more question by Aaron Smaltkes, who's asking, what do you do uh, full time? Like, what do you actually do in your day job, if you can share anything about that at all? Well, I, I, I pointed at the beginning the slide, I think slide number two, which you can go back and look at. Um, I, I've worked on tools like Ensight recently, um, which is a graphics debugger. So you, um, you're running your game and something looks wrong in a particular frame of your game, or there's a particular frame that's running slowly and you can fire up this tool, grab a frame of the game, and then look at everything that's happening on the graphics chip and in the, in the API. So in GPU Trace, you can actually see what units in the graphics chip are busy. And so then you can figure out why the code you've written is running slowly. In Ensight, you can look at the contents of the frame and figure out you know, that that triangle you drew was bright red and it shouldn't have been. You can get down, down to that kind of level. So I write tools like that. I actually was the first um, developer tools person to work for NVIDIA when I first arrived. I remember somebody asked me, what, you're just going to talk to developers and that's all you're going to do here. Um, so yeah, and I, well, actually, you're going to write tools because nobody there was nobody hired just to write tools when I arrived. So that's what I've done for my whole career. I love to write tools. And I hope that's obvious from the, the presentation. I like, I like to put tools in people's hands that make their life easier. Um, and I just find that a really interesting thing to do so so that's what i do yeah 
All right. That's awesome. And and uh, so you said that you had some stuff that was already open source. So wh- what was the, wh- what part of this is open source at the moment? Just the text editor, the resonality bit. Um, so it, there's a, sorry, there's a, res- there's a GitHub um, organization that I created called Resonality. And underneath that, I can put a link in the chat, I guess, um, is, um, is a, a shared C++ library, which is just my grab bag of bits called MUtils. And it used to be a library that built the world. It used to build all of these projects like Port Audio and OpenSSL and these horrible to compile C++ libraries. Um, and it used to be my central source. And then VC package came along and just removed that whole problem. Um, but yeah, so there's a shared library. There's the text editor called Zep. Uh, and if you just Google Zep GitHub, you'll find it. Um, and it has pictures on there of various things that it does. Um, and that, you know, these are all works in progress. Don't go away and think that that's even that is finished because it isn't. Um, uh, so yeah, and then the audio stuff um, and the visuals will come out later next year, as I, as I said. Yeah, one, one thing that I was thinking during your discussion was, and, and it was, it's something that I always think about because I come from kind of a high level using Juice as a framework to create uh, my plugins and audio apps. And I've always wondered what happens under the hood or how you work from the bottom up. And I think this talk has been really helpful for me because it really let me know some of the work and some of the thought processes that go on a couple levels below what happens at the framework level. And uh, another question that I have was just around working with the different APIs, because you said that this this is a cross-platform system, so you must be working with Core Audio and WhatsApp separately. And what do you find are the biggest challenges of working with those uh, different APIs, you know, setting up setting this up from Windows versus setting this up for, uh, for Mac platforms? And what are the differences in dealing with those APIs? Yeah, so the specifically the audio case, um, I don't actually talk to individual APIs. I use a thin layer called Port Audio, which basically uh, gives me a list of audio devices and audio APIs and, and lets me pick. And I can say, okay, on this system, use Wasapi and give me, um, you know, this many frames and this this, uh, and then and it just gives you back that callback that I showed at the beginning and asks me to fill in the the sound buffer. So so I don't go that deep for those things because it would just be a nightmare, right? If I had to write all these little, uh, use all these different APIs. Um, to be honest, the biggest cross-platform channel, challenge is build systems. Uh, as I was saying earlier on, I probably spend a quarter of my time uh, editing CMake files, uh, making GitHub Actions work properly, making um, continuous integration work properly. Um, all of that stuff just takes a lot of time and effort and maintenance, but you have to do it. If you want to build a piece of software that everybody uses, you have to be building you have to be compiling it for all platforms on every check-in. And mm. once you get to that realization, you are pretty much going to have to be a CMake expert and you're going to have to be a GitHub expert and you're going to have to be a scripting expert. And so that stuff takes a lot of time and effort. That's the big effort with cross-platform. Once you've got to the point where you understand the basics of cross-platform coding, that's not such a big deal, right? Occasionally there'll be some compiler difference, some small thing, but I, if you keep it generic, usually that's not the problem. It's the systems around it that are hard. I would say. Yeah, I mean, this completely echoes my uh, my experience as well. You know, I'm working on a project right now, which is also cross-platform. We also use CMake as the build system. And like the actual differences between the platforms, if you have a framework that kind of wraps them, that's not very often like the, the cause of the problem. It's like CMake, CI, like all the kinds of like scripts you need around that to make things work and like all of this stuff. Um, so it's interesting to me, like on a high level, like you know, it, it seems that many projects that kind of like build something like an audio engine, they bump in against like many of the same problems, like what you talked about with like thread synchronization. And then obviously now that we talked about the build system and, um, you know, the audio graph, like it seems that a lot of people are bumping against the same problems, but then you kind of find slightly different solutions to it. And yeah. it's, it's really, really interesting because, you know, uh, every every time someone talks about like how they actually implement like a whole big system, which contains an audio engine, um, like there are always these like differences and like, okay, there's a slightly different use case here. And then you just take this other approach here. And it's just, it's just really quite interesting. It's just maybe like a meta observation rather than a question really, but. Yeah, no, it's, it's true. And, and part of the fun of all of this is discovering how to solve those problems for yourself, right? 
And that's yeah. why I don't use juice, right? Not that juice isn't awesome, but for me, that takes away part of the fun. <laughs> yeah. And this is like, apart from like just being amazed at how much work you've done and how impressive this all is, like the other takeaway for me is like, obviously, you know, I'm working on an audio engine and like, I'm like, oh, we have, maybe we should consider this, you know? And like, um, yeah. I guess that's kind of uh, why it's like so valuable to have these talks where someone talks about like how they actually implemented stuff because you you, you get to like uh, see these different solutions and see if they apply to your problem and learn from each other really. I find that really cool. So yeah, thank you very, very much for just sharing all this. Yeah, sure. And as time goes by, you think I think things do get better. That's the interesting thing about this. When I started off trying to build all these complex libraries and then VC package came along and that really reduced the amount of work I had to do. And then another uh, ray of light was when Travis started charging for their continuous integration. Mm -hmm. And I had to learn how to use GitHub Actions. And then suddenly I'm like, oh, GitHub Actions, <laughs> they just work and they're much easier to use. And so, you know, you, you, you live and learn, don't you? Well, mm -hmm. a friend of mine says you live and learn and sometimes you just live. But <laughs> it's true. And also, I'm very relieved to hear that um, other people spend quarter of their time on maintaining build systems. <laughs> <laughs> so that seems oh. to be a common problem. Yeah. I, I have one more question before we move on. I mean, it, it seems like you're, that you, you're dedicating quite a serious amount of time to actually doing this project. And it's the type of time and the type of effort that a lot, of, I think a lot of people would charge for. So... I'd like to know your motivation for making this an open source project. Where does that where does that motivation stem from? Where you say, okay, I'm going to put in all of this hard work, but now I'm going to open source it and I'm just going to give it away to people for, to use. Uh, I think part of it is, as I said, I just like to build tools. Another part of it is that I've been at NVIDIA a long time and they've been very good to me. Um, so I'm not looking to, you know, make a fast book on, on some side project. That's kind of not where I'm coming from. I'm just, I'm doing this because it's something that I, I really love to do. And I, if you look at my website, which I, I showed a screenshot earlier on, I'm always building something, you know, and my, my make, biggest problem, honestly, is that is to tell myself to stop coding so that I can go eat and live the rest of my life. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm always fascinated by something new, whether it's advent of code, which I've I started doing this month before I realized it was insane to do that and this talk and keep on, on top of everything else. Um, you know, so there's always something new to do, uh, but I, I, and I enjoy it. So th there's no reason not to give it away for free. Um, what would satisfy me would be if people used it, you know, if it became part of the scene where I went to a, an algo rave and a couple of the guys on stage were using it to make music. And I think it would be very hard if I said, I'm going to charge for this application. Probably no one would use it. Then. <laughs> but if I make it open source and free, it might actually become something that people use and then I can, you know, smile proudly and, uh, and watch it go out into the world, which would be great. It's to me, it sounds like it would be a great educational tool for people that are trying to get a level lower than, than uh, juice and really learning how the, the nuts and bolts of audio programming really work. Uh, yeah, I think that's true. I, I hope that's true. Anyway, um, you know, the FFT, for example, there's a page of code in there that, shows you how to do an FFT in C++ when you've got the audio buffer to, from one end to the frequency bins. And at the beginning, that was really hard to find. I could I find little fragments on GitHub, little pieces of information from people. But, you know, working through those problems, figuring out the decibel conversion, the having window, the way that you convolve the data, all that stuff is hard. But once it's done and there's a page of code that shows you how to do it, then it's never going to be hard again. So uh, I hope that stuff will call, get out there and people will look at it. It's not yeah. all great code, but, but I, I don't tend to release it until it is. So <laughs> hopefully it'll be okay. Amazing. Great. I think it's a good time for us to uh, move on. Thank you very much, Chris, for that talk. That was, that was so educational for me. And, uh, and I think for a lot of people that, that are joining us as well. Thank you. It was uh, great to have an opportunity to show it off. So I appreciate it. Thank you.